It's really good to see you. A few of you chose to go without masks. I had no idea what you looked like. It's good to see you. Uh, really quickly, turn to somebody near you and say, I didn't know you looked like that, but you look really good. Good. Uh, so grateful you're with us this morning. I do want to welcome those of you who are joining us online as well. You're a part of a very unique and special experience this weekend. Uh, this weekend, we're really designing the entire service around the most sacred, one of the most sacred practices that God gave us, and that is communion. And so if you're joining us online, I'd love to invite you to even go somewhere in your house, get some bread, get a cup of juice, come back and join us so that you can participate in this experience with us. Uh, if you're in the room, hopefully you got the elements of community when you walked in. If for some reason you didn't, just throw a hand in the air. Uh, members of our guest host teams will come to make sure you have those elements. And so today we're going to simply walk through the experience of communion, hopefully in a little bit of a unique, different, and creative way. Uh, our hope is we weave together a couple of elements of teaching and song and reflection and video that it would allow us to really enter into to God's presence in a, in a meaningful way. Now, though you'll have the elements of communion with you the entire service, we're not going to take it until the very end, and we will actually take it all together once we get there. Now, as I think about communion, I was somebody who grew up in the church. I, I was around the church a lot as a kid, but I remember as a kid, I didn't really understand this thing called communion. I remember as a kid being in a church service, the pastor getting up on the stage, he said something about, now let's participate in the Lord's Supper, and I thought to myself, Supper? I love snack time in church. This sounds great. And I remember kind of being pumped about the thought that we were going to get some food in the middle of church. And they like hand out the elements. And I get this piece of bread that's a quarter the size of a Cheez-It. And then I get like this little tablespoon cup of something. I'm thinking, somebody calls this supper? I mean, this is like hardly a snack. And so I would say as a kid, I didn't really understand the significance and nor did I understand the sacred nature of this powerful spiritual practice that, again, the church has been practicing from the very, very beginning. And in many ways, as we really weave together this unique service where we take a look at communion, what I want to do is to take a look at communion and see what God desires for us to do when we celebrate this time together. I think in many ways, it's kind of this holistic experience that causes us to look in many directions. Part of what communion does is it causes us to look back. And really look back in a really powerful way. Now, as we talk about the celebration of communion, uh, maybe the first thing that causes you to think is, well, it's a celebration. The Lord's Supper is a celebration of the Last Supper. It's a celebration of that, that, that moment that Jesus gathered with his closest friends, that night that Jesus was betrayed, the night before he was crucified. They celebrated that meal together. And that's what, if you're thinking about, when you look back, you would be correct. At the same time, it's not simply just that. that. That Lord's Supper, that Last Supper, is only better understood if you understand the grander narrative, the, the bigger picture. I mean, to understand that particular moment without the grander picture would almost be like somebody saying, the, the, the Cubs won the 2016 World Series, which is true, they did. But unless you understand the bigger story, right? Like the 108 years of long suffering, unless you understand like the, uh, the, the curse of the billy goat, the black cat, the Bartman game, unless you understand the big picture, you miss the full significance of what it was like for the Cubs to win the World Series in 2016. I think in many ways, when we look back to that meal that Jesus celebrated, it was a powerful moment that Jesus celebrated that last supper with his disciples, but even that moment was a moment that they were looking back. I mean, it says this in the book of, of Matthew. It says this about that time that Jesus gathered with his closest followers. It says this. It says, on the first day of the festival of the unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, where do you want us to make preparations for you to eat the Passover meal? You see, what Jesus and the disciples were doing that, that night that he was betrayed is they were celebrating this ancient feast that had been practiced for the better part of 1,500 years. That even in Jesus' day, when he was celebrating this meal, it was a time to look back, specifically to look back to the time of the Exodus. Arguably, at the time, it was the single greatest moment in Israel's nation's history. They looked back to the time when, when God's people, the Israelites, they were enslaved the Egyptians. Now, I can't wrap my head around what that experience must have been like. 
I mean, not only were they slaves, their parents were slaves, their grandparents were slaves, their great-grandparents were slaves. Slavery was all that they had ever known. The Israelites at that time, they had been slaves for more years, almost as many years as like twice the number of years that we've been a country here in America. They've been slaves for 400 years. It's all they had ever known was bondage. It's all they had ever known was harsh circumstances, but yet they cried out to God and God heard their cries. And God sent this leader, his name was Moses. He had incredible courage, at least eventually, when he was empowered by God to go in front of the the, the most powerful leader of the day, the Pharaoh of all of Egypt. And he looked Pharaoh in the eyes and he says, let God's people go. And through a series of events, series of miracles, Ultimately, these plagues that came out on Egypt, everything culminated toward that tenth plague. And the tenth plague was the plague of the firstborn son, where what God said would happen is going to send the angel of death through the entire area. And that God was going to claim the life of the firstborn male child all throughout the nation of Egypt. But he instructed the nation of Israel with very particular commands. He says, I want you to go and take a lamb, and I want you to sacrifice that lamb. I want you to take the blood of the lamb, and I want you to paint the doorpost of your home with the blood of that lamb. And that way, when the angel of death comes through, that angel of death will pass over you. Sparing you death, you will instead receive life. It was actually the meat of that very lamb that they ate a meal together before this incredible moment of the exodus. And that meal became the foundation, the basis for this Passover meal that was celebrated every single year after that date. Because God did an amazing thing. He delivered his people. He set them free. He allowed them to experience something completely different. And because of that, every single year for 1,500 years, the Jewish people would gather in almost in a ritualistic type of experience, they would celebrate Passover. And so when you get to uh, Jesus celebrating the Lord's Supper together, that's what they're doing. They're celebrating the, the Passover feast. That moment where God spared them from death, allowed them to experience life, the precursor of his ultimate deliverance and freedom that he brought to them as a nation, That's what Jesus was celebrating with his disciples. Now, what's interesting, if you know anything about the Passover meal, what you might know is, again, there were all kinds of rituals with it. There were certain candles that you lit. Uh, It was a very methodical experience where there were certain scriptures that were read, sayings that were were spoken. It was a very powerful experience. Now, most of the, the entire experience was based around... Uh, this, this verse from the book of Exodus is they're remembering that, that initial Passover. And four different times in the Passover meal, they would pause and they would eat and drink. And every time they paused, they would remember a different promise of what God had promised them as a people based on Exodus chapter 6, verses 6 and 7. Here's the promise in the book of Exodus. It says this. It says, therefore, say to the Israelites, I am the Lord. Help me out with the underlined parts. It says, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. I will free you from being slaves to them. I will redeem you with an outstretched arm with a mighty act of judgment. I will take you as my own people, and I will be your God. Then you will know that I am the Lord your God who brought you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. There's four promises. God says, I will bring you out, I will free you, I will redeem you, I will take you as my own people. And again, that was a look back at what God did. What they didn't know, they were also taking a look at what God was actually already doing. That God was about to bring them out again. God was about to bring freedom again. God was about to redeem again. That God was about to make them a people again in Jesus. And so what happens in this meal is this grand story that has been playing out for 1,500 years. Jesus now connects himself to the story. And it's actually at the third promise, when they got there in the Passover feast, when they got to the third promise that was all about God saying, I will redeem you, that's the moment that Jesus took the bread. 
That's the moment that he took the bread and he broke it. It says this in Matthew chapter 26. It says, while they were eating, Jesus took the bread, gave thanks and broke it, and gave it to the disciples saying, take and eat, this is my body. That was connected to the redemption promise. That God promised that he would bring his people out. He'd free them. He would redeem them. They would be his people. And Jesus says, God's about to do it again. God's about to do it again in me and ultimately through me. There's something powerful about the symbol of bread all throughout Scripture. All throughout Scripture, bread has been the symbol of God's provision. You think all the way back in the Old Testament where God brought manna in the wilderness, that God always provided for his people. You think about bread and its, its ability to sustain life. It's, it's essential for life. And in many ways, it's essential for our lives even today. You think about even a little bit later that, that Jesus, in his own ministry, he fed 5,000 people. And after doing so, he said, I am the bread of life. That I am the one who gives life. And so in this moment, Jesus connecting himself to the grand story of what God is doing. He takes the bread, he breaks it, and he says, this is my body. In a sense, he's saying, I recognize the brokenness that exists in you. And so now my body will be broken so that yours can be made whole again. Jesus steps into the story of redemption. As a part of communion, it causes us to look back. To look back to the grand story of what God has been doing for literally thousands and thousands of years, but also it gives us a chance to look back into our own story. And I look back into my own story, I'm reminded how God's been a provider in my life, time and time and time again. I'm reminded about the moments that God has brought life and fulfillment to my own journey, time and time and time again. I look back to so many different moments that I needed the forgiveness and the redemption of God time and time and time again. Communion causes us to look back into the grand story of God and its intersection to my own story. And so what I love to do is to simply pause for a moment. And I'd ask that you just put your eyes on the screens. The screens are going to help us just walk through just a moment of reflection. And as a question comes up on the screen, I just ask that you prayerfully consider the question. Allow this to be a time that you connect with God, that you meditate on the question, that you look back into your own story and see God's provision in your own journey. And then we'll come back together again. After the disciples took the bread, Jesus took the cup and he gave thanks. And that was pretty standard. It was less than noteworthy. But, but then Jesus did something that you just didn't do in Jewish custom. After 1,500 years of the Passover meal, of food being served in a very specific order and words being spoken liturgically just so, Jesus broke from the script. And rather than going on with the ceremony, Jesus said these words, This is the blood of the covenant. This is the blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. And then he took the cup and he gave thanks and he offered it to them saying, Drink from it, all of you. Now, this was very interesting. And, and, and kind of confusing at the same time because Jesus, he just switched from Passover language to Jewish wedding language. 
You see, in that culture, a cup of wine is how a man proposed to a woman. Today, we get down on one knee, we present a ring. But back then, a man would hold a cup of wine and he would propose marriage and then he would drink from it. And then he would set it down in front of the woman. And if she drank from it, then she accepted his proposal. And what would happen in that culture if a woman accepted her proposal is that the man would then leave the house and set off to do two things. First, he had to raise the bride price. That's kind of like the fee for the wife. The more, the more precious the wife, the bigger the bride price. And then after he raised that, he had to build a house for him and his future wife. And so here's Jesus in the middle of this Passover ceremony, and he takes this third cup, the, the cup of redemption, and he says, I enter into this covenant, this, this new wedding type of covenant. And, and after that, the disciples, like a bride, they then take and they drink from the cup. And Jesus starts talking about the price he is going to pay for them on the cross, the sacrifice he's going to make, the blood that he's going to shed. And then over in John 14, we hear Jesus say these words, in my father's house are many rooms. And if it were not so, I, I would have told you that I go to prepare a place for you. Do you hear it? I go to prepare a home, a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and, and will take you to myself that where I am, you may also be. You see, the Passover meal was their tradition up until this point. And now Jesus is ushering in an entirely new plan. He was pointing to himself as the deliverer, as the one who would pay the price to bring us home to God. This ancient meal, it's full of symbolism, symbolism of uh, of what did happen to the nation of Israel, what was going to happen to Christ, and, and what is going to happen to us. This meal is the new covenant. Jesus said in Matthew 26, he said, this is the blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. And as we receive the cup, as we receive this cup, we practice remembering and participating in what Jesus has done for us. We remember. Jesus knew that you and I get easily distracted. We, we forget sometimes. Maybe you forget sometimes that you're forgiven. You get weighed down by guilt and you just feel crushed and defeated by it. When I forget that I'm a forgiven person, I need to come back to this table, back to the forgiveness of, of Jesus, back to the blood that was shed for me. And remember that I am forgiven. I'm cleansed and I'm set free. You know, sometimes we forget that we're called to be servants. I, I forget this and I get caught up in wanting to have things my own way. I, I'm worried about my ego, what's in it for me. I, I then need to come back to this table and remember that I follow one who served who picked up a towel and basin of water and washed the feet of his friends, who suffered and died for them and for you and for me. I need to remember that I need to be a servant like Jesus was. You know, sometimes I forget, I forget that I'm part of a family and I sometimes feel very alone in the universe. I forget that I'm part of a family with so many of you who are my brothers and sisters I need to come to this table together with you and remember that I'm not alone. I need to remember that, 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 that I'm not alone in the universe, that God has provided for me family. He's provided for me church family. We're not alone. And when this is done right, remembering is one of the most powerful things that a human being can do. Communion is a monument to remembering Christ. We remember, and then we also participate. It's really significant that, that Jesus didn't tell us to just look at the bread, you know, look at the cup of, of adoration, just, just look at them and observe them. He asked us to partake, to eat a piece of bread, to drink some of that cup. And he did that deliberately. 
The word that's translated participation actually comes from the Greek word koinonia. It's also translated fellowship in the New Testament. Communion is intended to be a communal dinner, a, a common table that we participate in together with other believers. And together we remember what Jesus did for us. And if I begin to forget, well, then you help me remember. <laughs> and if you, if you begin to forget, well, then I help you remember what Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection means for you and I. And so we continue to experience his work in us and through us even today. I think in many ways, communion gives us the opportunity to look back. And as Dave described, it also gives us the opportunity to look within. Uh, there's so much that we have to, the ability to do in times like this when we come into communion with the presence of God that gives us the chance to remember, to take this deep look within. But I think that if you understand this, this powerful practice, this sacred practice of communion, we not only look back and look within, we also look around. And Dave described this a little bit, but really when we look around, we recognize that this ancient practice of communion has been practiced for thousands of years across every culture, across every people, across every Christian denomination. Everybody leans into this particular spiritual practice. I mean, it's really something powerful to think that you and I are a part of this big C church that really uh, reaches every single part of our globe. That as we get to celebrate communion together, that we are connected with our brothers and sisters all throughout Latin America who experience the Lord's Supper today. And you think about when we get to experience communion together, we're, we're connected uh, with those who are brothers and sisters all throughout the continent of Africa, all throughout Asia, all uh, who, are, who live in the big island of Australia, all throughout Europe, and even in war-torn Eastern Europe. Our brothers and sisters who are standing and persevering and faithfully attempting to stand for God in a very, very difficult situation, they celebrate this meal, and in some supernatural way, our hearts are connected to our brothers and sisters all over the globe as we get to experience this. There are no boundaries as we get to recognize that communion is like community, that it connects us all together as one body of Christ. And as much as communion connects us as one global body of Christ, there's also something about looking around to our local body as well. You see, Scripture also teaches us about when we come into to seasons like this and places of worship about how important our community with one another is. It says this in the book of Matthew chapter 5, this is Jesus' words, he says, therefore if you're offering your, offering your gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother or sister has something against you. Leave your gift in front of the altar. First go and be reconciled to them and then come back and offer your gift. Basically what he's saying is this. Is that your communion with God, your community with God is inextricably tied to your community and your communion with one another. And if we ever get into a situation like this that we remember that, that something is broken in my relationship with others, that actually hinders my relationship with him. And so I've got to work to reconcile things with one another in order to fully experience all that God has for us. Because part of communion is to look around and to recognize that coming into the presence of God is also, in doing so, coming together in the presence of one another. And so communion gives us the opportunity to look back, to look within, to look around, 
and also to look ahead. One of the things that I love about looking ahead is communion gives us the opportunity not only to remember what God has done and the promises he has made, but also to anchor our lives to the future promises that have not fully been fulfilled yet. Look what it says for us. These are Paul's words in the book of 1 Corinthians. Talking about communion, it says, For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So that every time we get to celebrate this meal of communion, we actually look ahead to what God has ultimately promised. Uh, do you remember the, the promises that we talked about earlier from the book of Exodus chapter 6, those promises where God says that I will bring you out, I will free you, I will redeem you, I will take you as my people. When he gave those promises in the book of Exodus, those were very tangible, physical promises of what God was going to do right now in this age. That he was going to take people out of Egypt. He was going to free them from their, uh, from their, their captivity. Uh, he was going to redeem them. He was going to call them to be their own people. And though that was a promise that God fulfilled, that is also still the promise that you and I hang our lives to today. Because God also says to you and I that I'm going to bring you out of this broken world. God says that I'm going to free you from the, the bondage of sin that sometimes so hinders us in our lives that God says to you, I'm going to redeem you. I'm going to make you my people. The same promises that anchored the God's people some over 2,000, 3,000 years ago are the same promises that you and I have the opportunity to look forward to today. It reminds me of the words that come off the pen of the Apostle John in the book of Revelation that look ahead. He just says, And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people. He will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. Friends, I don't know where you're at in your journey. For some of us, we walk in this morning and our lives feel incredibly broken. Lost, full of hurt, full of pain. Communion reminds us of a God who's made good on every promise that he's ever made. And a God who makes the same promise to you today that he will pull you out, he will set you free, he will redeem you, he will make you his people. As we draw into his presence today, let us take time to pause to look back. Look back at God's story and look back at how God's story connects to your story. As we celebrate communion today, Let's pause and take a look within and be mindful of and remember the things that God has done and God continues to do in and through our lives. So we take communion today. Let's pause and look around. That we are part of God's church, his holy people, united across every country, every language, every ethnicity, there's just one church. It's his church. Now let's look ahead. That no matter how much pain we've experienced in this world, we look forward to the day that there's no more. No more pain. No more heartache. No more war. No more loss. No more death. No more tears. Because our God will make right, make good on his promise through Jesus. I'm going to say a prayer for us. The band's going to come and we're going to sing one more song together before we take communion together. And in this song, if you want to stand up and sing and participate, you can. If you want to remain seated, more reflective, you can. I just ask that during this song, you use it as an opportunity to come into communion community with your, with your God, your Father, through Jesus, allow it to be a time that you connect into his presence. But God, we say thank you for the opportunity you give us
to celebrate this sacred meal in communion. God, we recognize that we are just a small part of a grand story that you have been, you've been writing for thousands of years. And God, as we participate in this moment, we're participating as a part of this sacred, sacred experience. God, help us look back with gratitude. Help us look within with authenticity. Help us look around with connectivity and help us look ahead with hope. God, we say thanks for Jesus. It's in his name we pray. Amen. It was the night that Jesus was betrayed, that he gathered with his closest friends in that upper room to celebrate that Passover meal. And even in the moment, they looked back. The moment they took a look within, they looked around. But they didn't fully know what was ahead. But in this moment, Jesus connects himself to the greater redemption story that God was up to, even in their midst. And so he took the loaf of bread and, and he broke it. He gave thanks. He says, this is my body. It's going to be given for you. He said, take this and eat it and remember me. Let's take the bread together. Then Jesus took the cup. And he said, this is the blood of the new covenant. In many ways, it's the blood that was shed so the angel of death passes over us so that you and I can experience life. He said, take this, drink it, and remember me. Let's take the cup together. God, with hearts of gratitude, we just simply say thank you. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for your presence. Thank you for your deliverance. God, thank you for your promise. May we anchor our lives fully in you. We love you, Jesus. It's in your name we pray.